everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lounge Podcast. Uh, my name is Nathaniel, and ooh, and I'm here with uh, Kai, Shane Lester, uh, Story Mark, and Water Dark. Hi guys, how's it going? Hey, uh... yeah, greetings. Good. Good. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, um, yeah. Today I was going to mainly focus around um, like magic, like different types of magic systems in stories. Um, I believe. I should have checked back on it, but I believe it was Lester that posted that that particular topic. Yeah, it definitely that, sounds like something. Yeah. So mm. if you want, you can quickly mm. run the instruction or your thoughts on why you came out the question. Yeah, so it. I think the main reason why I chose like to uh, like one of these topics to talk about is because uh, essentially everything I write, or at least like most of the things I write, is basically based around like uh, it's sort of like an action action like shonen thing in fact like shonen is in my name (laughs) so i've definitely have always been like a fan of these uh sort of like everything like with power power systems and such so i've always just thought sort of thought like what makes what makes like the best one what uh and what uh uh works and what doesn't work i think to answer the first question really like what makes the best system the answer is like uh there is no answer. Like, there's no right or wrong system. It always depends on the context of what you're going for. So, uh, I really don't like bring the, bringing them up, but the MCU, uh, basically that kind of just flashy, um, in your face, and also just like general cool, cool stuff you could pull off. So that's always been something I've sort of always lean towards but i don't want like things to be like too random one thing i absolutely want to avoid is obviously doing doing something like dragon ball uh which like i probably riled on it a bit but uh just to to reiterate i don't particularly hate it but i've just never been that big of a fat fan uh anyway dragon ball actually has a pretty good system it's yeah writing issues yeah it's just like i've definitely come to have like several issues with um I think particularly like the latter stuff where oh, I agree. Especially mm. my biggest gripe with most modern systems is the inclusion of arbitrary numbers. Yeah. And that has always been something I have ranted and raved about uh until until I blew the face. Oh, I know with him that's why I hate lit RPG, but that's a whole yeah. other conversation. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation that uh why I'm not gonna go into because honestly I can um go I'll go on for a fortnight about how much I despise that stuff. But uh I think one uh so I think one premise I've sort of come to uh when sort of like sort of looking into and thinking about like these systems, uh one thing that gets thrown around a lot is the idea of um, soft magic and hard magic. So sort of, which I sort of think is a good sort of jumping off point for this discussion. So just to lay some context, soft magic is essentially where the sort of rules and laws of like the sort of mad, the sort of magic system that's been employed is explained enough that it's, that you can accept that it's something that, happens if it makes sense but getting into like the like, you know the metaphysical ins and outs of it um is uh it generally doesn't so it's more of like a device to go okay here's like building blocks what cool stuff can i just fan out of this um and again this is now this is a this is actually a topic i generally don't like a uh, subject i don't like pretty bring up a lot, but I think it's, like, a really good example is Harry Potter. Like, they never re- like, if you've, I've read the books, I've, I've been forced to watch all the, uh, movies when I was a child, even though I was terrified of them, because I was, uh, terrible, terrible at films. Uh, but that, that's, I always find that magic system a really good case study, like, at least, like, in the early books, because it never really explains it, and it also, like, plays on sort of Especially, like, the child uh, that I was at that time, where sort of magic doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a GCSE um, homework. It's, you know, it's mag- It's just, it's magic. It's I don't need to, to know what, what it is. And then you have, and the eighth, 
antithesis of that is hard magic system, where everything is explained in minute detail. There are specific laws and rules that govern everything. Govern it. It's, I definitely argue, the hardest of the two to do, especially because you can... It can lead to basically a system being very rigid, but sort of pulled off right and sort of well explained and expand on, you can have something uh, fairly unique and interesting. I think my greatest example is Net, because I think it's going to be brought up, is Nen from Hunter x Hunter. It's explained in, introduced in the uh, Tower of Heaven arc. Uh, correct me if I if I got that um, correct. Um, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and uh, I've re- it's been years since I've seen it, but it, uh, what I remember is that um, the way Nen works is that it uh, is basically like a spectrum where uh, an individual can pull towards like a specific type, and their powers will sort of manifest based on that type. But it's not you're not always completely locked into it. You can have uh, move into like other areas, so. I believe like Kurapeka, like I forgot his um his ones, but he went ha- got a specific um specialty in that system specifically for his objective, which is to kill the phantom troop for uh, wiping out his his uh, tribe. Uh, and mm. what like and even though like it is like a very rigid system, to get uh. What you have, like, going further is some of the, some of the most, like, creative powers, uh, I've seen in, like, Shonen, Shonen. And this is stuff that don't rely on, you know, like, Kamehameha's or, um, uh, just sheer power. So I think the most creative one, I forgot the name of the character, but it was this, um, interest, Nen interest, um, power that essentially, Every time he hits, he transfers Nen into you, and when you get to a specific pot, uh, sp- get up to a specific uh, number of interest, uh, it'll essentially explode, and then lock completely robs um, the affected their ability to use Nen. So that's like one example of like really interesting system. I think my personal favorite is like uh, Coronello's um, sort of book, where he can all he has to do is, uh, if I believe, like just touch someone. And he can copy the Nen, the Nen ability into that book, and sort of pull it out when uh, he he needs needs it. Yeah, usually, yeah, usually soft and magic because we, we we talked about it a little bit before. But yeah, literally mm-hmm. soft and half magic systems where is where half magic systems the rules are more more grounded. You actually understand the rules. The soft magic system is more fantastical. But I think I think an interest another interesting thing that we came up when we talked about it is like. Soft magic system is only soft until you understand what it is. So it's kind of like science, where there's some things we don't understand, and then after more research, people start understanding it. Okay, sure, there's going to be things that will probably be a bit beyond us, you, and realistically, if you can have that magic system, fair play to you, and that's that's perfectly fine. But I think that's just the interesting take where that that soft and the hard can really vary on the world you're in and what the characters know, and what each in, even between themselves, like what what what's what can be soft to one character could be seen more hard to another character just by their knowledge of that power. I do want to, I do want to kind of um, piggyback off of that for a minute, because that is a pretty good point. And I think we may have talked about this before, but Mm -hmm. the thing about magic and special abilities, or dare I say, high concept notions is that we as the audience, we're discovering them. But the thing is, Mm -hmm. there is also the angle to consider that characters are also discovering how this stuff works too. Even though there may be defined laws, there are moments where some people can start to flip out where they're like, but this isn't how it's written. How how is this person managing to break the rules? It's quite Mm -hmm. simple. Science changes and evolves over time with our Mm -hmm. understanding. So even within quote unquote hard magic systems, I would argue you have almost as much freedom as you do in soft systems, because it is possible for you to have a story where a character is actively breaking everyone's perceptions and everyone's sense of rules on how these things are supposed to work. So I don't really think hard magic systems are nearly as intimidating as people think they are in, in execution. I really think it's just a matter of what time. What time period is this story taking place in within the context of the world? I'm most. Uh, 
I think one of the issues is because people are approaching it the wrong way. You're, you're mm -hmm. just thinking purely hard and soft when there's actually way more that to it that you can factor mm -hmm. in. For instance, mm -hmm. instead of just thinking about the simple hard versus soft, which this simplifies just how much knowledge you have over the system. The, mm -hmm. That sums it up in a sentence. But exactly. an easier way to think of it, to think of it on the axis, rational to irrational as well, mm -hmm. which is a completely different system. Um, access to um, hard and soft, it's something I learned from studying the magic system blueprint. It's a really fascinating book and stuff like that on it. Pretty much, it's the more common the magic, the more likely people are to encounter it and, like, you know, get the um, patterns and stuff like that. And so, rationalize the system. And what more people get obsessed with is, like, I'm trying to rationalize systems and stuff like that from what I've noticed. And just seeing that as hard, like, pretty much a system doesn't have to, can be, a system can be irrational, but still hard and stuff like that. And you can get flexibility out of that. And also, there's ones you can just have, like, um, a system that's maybe soft, but it's rational, you know, because you don't understand how it works, but, you know, do this and repeat these patterns and stuff like that, and this mm -hmm. will happen. Mm -hmm. exactly. So that's why those are, like, mm. two different things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's what you me thinking a little bit. I don't know. I, I, I've only still think, um, work my thoughts in it, because it just, just kind of hit me now. But it's like, I guess the, the means and the ends does also determine what is hard and soft. Because, like, you can say with soft magic system, you can say, okay, I know if I do this, this happens. But what, what is happening afterwards, God knows. Um, but it works. So, but hard magic system is like, oh, you know, you already know to, um, exactly what's happening whilst you're doing the magic, I guess. I However, at the same time, though, it doesn't necessarily mean that there still isn't enough room to like add another another variable to oh, it. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Because because mm. that's if you ask me, is still what what makes these systems interesting. Now, granted, I will probably never do a hard magic system, even if um even if I wanted to, despite the fact that what I'm working on has kind of melded a something of a magic system and science together. I don't know if I could look you in the, in the eye and tell you that it's particularly hard either. I don't know if I could really tell you if it's, um, if it's a hard system overall. What I've noticed um, with these systems, it's not that, it's more of a sliding scale type exactly, thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's actually one reason why I like the whole not just seeing soft and hard, because I think that's way too simplistic, honestly, at this point. Mm. But like yeah, why I like having stuff like, yeah, like why I like having stuff like rational and irrational because like it becomes this mm. four coordinates and type thing and you can place things in different coordinates on there. Like, okay, mm. this one's like, oh man, I wish I had something, a drawing to go with this, whatever. Like, let's say we have the simple, what is that called? I'm trying to remember when you like having, um, not an X, but a cross shape, right? Oh, you dude, like, no, let's say it, an axis sort of, was it? Yes. I, I know what I mean, like the cross, yeah. yeah. I, I literally said axis before and I couldn't think the word. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, let's say like you have something that's um rational and it's more hard and everything like that. Like usually Sanderson's magic systems tend to lean to this. Mm -hmm. And so it would be up in this axis and everything like that. Then let's say you have something like let's use Superman's powers real quick, right? Like we know how they work, but they are tend to lean to irrational and stuff like that. So like he he like he replicates it over and over again and stuff. Well, wait. They're soft, but he re able, he knows how it works, so he can replicate it over and over again and stuff like that. Mm. And so it would lean elsewhere and so on like that. And so, like, it goes to the idea that each one is different, but, like, there's different ways it leans towards and so on. With the whole rational, rational, how much knowledge do we have of how the system works versus how much knowledge we have, we don't have of how it works. Mm. Yeah, and, and that even mm. goes to between the one character and another. Like you said, for example, Superman knows how his powers work, but for us, it's like, oh, this is, oh, okay, you can do that. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's that back to the perspective and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. And then um, there's stuff like mm -hmm. um, just think about stuff like there's that there's the concept of transference. There's mm -hmm. the prevalence of magic. There's the source of it. The flux, the naturalness, the ease of use, reliability, consistent. Like I think hard versus salt is boring when you actually look at the exactly. whole details of stuff yeah. you can actually mm -hmm. dig into. Right, because because it's just kind of. It's it's kind of a common problem with any kind of binary thinking when you're approaching any work in general. Because <laughs> um, um, mm. this might be a little bit of an aside, but I did have a conversation with a really good friend of mine the other day. It was about um, hard and soft strength. Now, when you hear these two, you're probably thinking, "What exactly does this mean? Like, are we talking about the strength to blow up walls, or are we just talking about like the strength not to do it?" It's more like when we think about hard strength, yes, we can think about a literal sense of, you know, this character being extremely powerful. 
However, when we talk about soft strength, this is where things start to get interesting. It wasn't a matter of being strong in strength, but strong in spirit. Like you're there to actually guide the person that's right next to you. Like you're perfect. You're like, like you're compliments to each other. This mm. person is the one responsible who will break the wall, but they need someone who is who, um, who bears this soft strength in order to build them up again after the struggle is complete. So the dichotomy itself doesn't really have to be there. More so, we need to find a way in which these two opposite forces can complement each other rather than be in stark opposition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the concept mm. do with that. Um, it also just brings up uh, another thought of me because, like, we say soft magic, and I think another way it's kind of they can reference soft magic is is its level of awe it has to the reader because soft magic is again what people say, especially we go back perspective, it's something where the person who's seen it doesn't understand how it works, but they see mm-hmm. something magical has happened, and that's that level or does kind of lean more on the emotional side of things and when you deal with stories so i think i think a good example for me um it's wheel of time it has a dream world called a teleron rod and it's a bit more it's more soft magic in there because it's almost kind of like what you imagine can work there are some rules but essentially it's a bit more loose with its with its magic in there but then also there's the one power which is a bit more on the harder side though it could do some crazy things as well um so and it's in what that's in one story. So you can have that like them two things kind of working with with each other. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I guess because I was wondering when this might come up because I you know like Sanderson's three laws, um, in regards to like magic systems, which I think is a really good like uh system. I actually, I think we maybe a quick bit of hair and we can probably just. Uh, I I need to read more of Sanderson's work. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's really well. Mm. Mm. I, lo- I love the three laws of magic. Well, the three laws for magic and world building, which mm. I can, like, if you want, I can add, I can say them real quick. If, if you don't want to, I don't care uh, who really says them. They're uh, just no. good to know. Okay, yeah, go, ahead. Yeah, go, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. So, mm, yeah. three, there's technically four laws. We'll come to the zero law, law in a second. Mm-hmm. First law the author's ability to resolve conflict in a satisfying way with magic is directionally proportional to how the reader understands said mag- magic. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you have hard, like, if you're going to have magic solve the problem in the end or the climax or anything like that, you're going to want a hard system or, like, you know, magic interacts in whatever way, even if you don't know all the details. So, like, um, you know what? Since we already brought up the MCU, let's use WandaVision real quick. Oh, like, boy. we don't know much of how the all the Scarlet Witch powers, the chaos magic and stuff works, but we did learn a little bit beforehand that, um, like, if you use the runes and you have the, that set up and everything like that, that it, um, what does the runes do? If anyone else has seen it, can you remind me? I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I, think I like, see that's how I really call it. That's it. it any it, runes that are made by a, a caster inside, all other people inside the room that the runes were made of, they can't use magic and stuff like that. Hmm. She learns that while she's trapped inside um, Agatha's room, and so when she create recreates it on the outside and so on like that, it like it makes we that makes sense and works within what we already know because it's direct, it's proportional to what we do understand about the magic without learning too much of anything else. The second law is weaknesses are more interesting than powers, which I have so much I can mm-hmm. add on that. Mm-hmm. It's also uh, why, I, it's kind of why I hate, like, since eh, the top reason my channel blew up was the whole me making magic systems thing, like different categories and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And something that ticks me off every single time I see this comment is when people ask me, like, can I do all of them? I'm going to do all of them. I'm going to have every system possible. And I'm just like, oh, gosh. No. No, that, no, that, that's you, a, you that goes into the territory I hate so much. You, you legitimately cannot do that. If you try to do everything all at once, you yeah, are never going nothing. to succeed. Yeah. And not only that, but the problem with taking on that mentality is that whether you realize it or not you are going to end up veering in one direction or the other and if you try to play this juggling act with all of these different ideas and concepts not only is it going to be nigh incomprehensible but it's going to be really difficult to get invested i mean i'm not talking about power level debates because that is like nah i ain't talking about a catfish yeah yeah that <laughs> Yeah. yeah. What you end up having is a situation where your system is going to end up being very poorly defined because you can't necessarily ground yourself. You're trying to do everything at once. And without mm. that sense of grounding, 
there is absolutely no consistency. Yeah. That's what you have is yeah. you, you become a jack of all trades, master of none. Which yeah, inherently, that's which, a very good. Uh, which inherently, which inherently is not entirely a bad thing. Mm. Mm. Being, able, yeah. um, being multifaceted and multi-talented within your writing is not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. However, if you're working within your systems and. There's a reason why when some people watch some things, like, I don't know, like Death Battle with Goku and Superman, there's a reason why that thing tick, um, ticks people off. It's because they feel as though, depending on how you're interpreting the powers of these individual characters within their respective lores, it just kind of, the, the conclusion for each one of them being all the same tends to, tends to tick the same people off, because it's like, within this context, if you did it this way, this is how it would work out. Now, granted, when it comes to like these kind of things, they're always going to be debatable. But the problem is, if you're doing it within your own story to the point where you have to, we have to debate what is happening within your work, that's probably that's probably a sign that you made a mistake. Yeah. You probably made a mistake you're, somewhere. You're, you're, you're juggling yeah. too much. So. Yeah, I think in terms yeah. of that, like I said, because I said, because I get, I get the wanting to like try to do as much as you can, but I think ultimately you do need to. Say, say, like my pers my example being like I'm writing a shonen rom, and I, d I definitely a lot of it is like what the heck I have I found cool at the time, but I've definitely like especially the more I've written, the more I've sort of uh, faster in of what like my system is, mm. and I know that I can't just throw as much stuff into it as possible, otherwise it's just it, none of it will make sense, it'll just be a random random mess, so yeah. it's about, like, identifying what works for you and then rolling with it, as opposed to just trying to smash as m many things into it as you can. Yeah, that really touches into the third ball. There's some other stuff I was going to say for the second, I'll come back to in a minute, but that mm. touches on the third one, which is expand, don't add, like, which pretty much try dig in depth into what you have with your system and try to make the most of it instead of like adding more and more and more and more to it. Like, it's a matter of because I understand why people do this beyond just the whole pilot. Like, there's this whole psychological thing to it where people often will look outside of themselves and try and add in more to explain things instead of looking at what they have. And, like, as I learned, thinking inside the box, figuring out how to work with what you have there and everything like that and make the most of it. Which is why it helps to expand instead of add. And for the second one with weaknesses or more interesting powers, I often find people get obsessed with like the power itself and like adding on and on, like as we were saying it. And like as he best puts, don't or yeah. The second thing is that what magic can't do for your story and characters is way more interesting than what it can do because you know yeah. magic is something we're just making up. It can be whatever someone says it is because we said so. Like I can come up with all kinds of bullshit pseudoscience stuff to explain whatever but it's still ultimately just whatever i want to make it do mm, yeah. but then also comes around though to what the zero law is always err on the side of what is awesome so yeah still, still do stuff that's <laughs> awesome it's magic like have fun with it yeah like that's how i see it myself like um whether or not you're working with like um something like a sci-fi magic system kind of like what tales of the abyss has or within what I have been playing with, at the end of the day, magic is supposed to be mystical and fun. Like, you do have rules, yes. You want to ground your system. But you have to remember to have fun with it on top of all of that. Mm. Yeah, I'd say the, the, the rules make it fun, but that's just exactly. me. Like, yeah. Oh, no, you, no, you are very right. Yeah, yeah. The rules actually make it fun. Like, the idea of knowing what your systems can or cannot do is what can make things fundamentally interesting. Like, some folks might think that just like the restrictions by themselves are just that restrictions, but they're there for you to play within your own rules. Because what is the fun of restrictions if not to find some way to break them? Mm. Yeah. Because like if you're able to break your own rules without absolutely breaking the rules of your established world over your knees, it means that you've done something that we um that I think Mark already mentioned earlier. Expand. You are actively adding an expansion to what you're doing by breaking your own rules, but not breaking them so much to the point where we're turning up our nose. No, you've managed to break this in the sense of you, a, a, science, a scientist observes something long enough, and when they see something, they're like, wait a minute, that completely breaks the rules of what I thought, of what we thought we had before. This completely breaks the standard, but it doesn't fundamentally override our theory. Yeah. So me, you it's, not even, 
So for me, it's saying less about breaking the rules. Like I find fun in the rules. Like for instance, let's say let's use um Harry Potter real quick. We're gonna let's of course that's a perfect example of it. So like, does anyone really like? Yes, it's fun thinking about all the ideas of like with Harry Potter and spells like stuff, stuff like that. That's the easy side. There actually is something in Harry Potter that was that's a bit more hard magic that's never really explained, and I considered it way more fascinating and fun to go into. If um, does anyone has anyone here ever looked at the wand lore? Like how, like how wands nah, actually work? No, nah. no, 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 not that deep. All right, perfect. Let me pull this up real quick. Well, see, all wands like wands they have um various things that deal with how wands are built and so on like that. Like I read up on it, like different woods will impact spells in different ways like that. The different sizes um. Like what goes into it, etc. Like so, I'm like, no, this is way more fascinating because when people, when you have these de- types, yeah, when you have these types of details, people can like think about it more and they can play into it and they can customize it towards what's what works mm-hmm. for them. Like that's one reason why stuff like um Hunter Hunter is fun. It's because there are so many concrete rules that you pretty much can specialize it to yourself and figure out what fits you and what works exactly. for you. Mm. Yeah, and so it's way more fun to work within the rules than to try and be like, I'm adding more and I'm finding like. Yeah. No, working within is where the fun is because then right. like, it, it gives you more in the story and it gives more people outside of stuff to play with and make their own imagination and so on. Yeah. Because, what, because what ends up happening is that even with because even within those restrictions that you've set for yourself, there's still a lot of room for a mm-hmm. lot um, for a lot of clever ideas within the defined rules that you do have. So I think so I think the spectrum that we have either between breaking the rules or playing in the rules both of them are exceptionally valid for what they're for what they're worth especially the idea of like I mentioned earlier even though I did mention this earlier like breaking the rules can be fun and all but like you said there's still a lot of catharsis you could get knowing full well that I've kind of established that my magic isn't really capable of doing this however there is another aspect or another branch of this theory that these characters as well as myself have never really considered until I put it in a different context. Mm. Mm. I was wondering uh, if I could chime in a little bit on uh, having a magic system within the rules. By the mm-hmm. way, mm. if I don't mind. Um, I just wanted to just talk about witch hat for a bit because I think it's it's kind of like um, the hunter hunter system where it's extremely flexible mm-hmm. depending on the person because um, in witch hat uh, atelier, pretty much. The idea is that anyone can use magic because it is used with magic paper and magic ink. Mm-hmm. Oh, or not actually I, paper. I most know of the ink. Most of the ink, yes. You, you already, mm. probably already know it, Shonen. Yeah. But essentially, it's the, uh, with this magic system, it's all about combinations of how you draw with the ink itself, mm. which, depending on uh, which has its own rules. But it's very flexible because it could, it essentially just changes how the magic works. I'll just, I'll just show an image of it because I'm just looking it up real quick. But the most important thing is not the combinations exactly, but the, uh, the fact that anyone can use it. But the issue instead is how people control the knowledge of the glyphs themselves. Ah. And mm. in a way, there's the difference between the people who know and the people who don't. And it's mm-hmm. sort of like, a rule made because of some sort of like past incident where yeah. everyone used to be able to use magic, but after some sort of like cataclysm or horrible event, it was split between the people who know and people who don't. And mm. then the, even the people who know are split between two groups, which are the, um, I forgot, what are the normal hats? Essentially the, um, the normal hats and then brim hat. So brim hats are kind of like the extremists who mm. know magic. But yeah. they kind of want, um, they essentially want people uh, to uh, not really break the rules, but kind of go back to the days of old, where they use more forbidden magic that deals with the human body and stuff. Mm. While the current current magic society is like, hey, we just want to stay in the rules, uh, make sure that you uh, follow our examples and things. Don't do anything that involves um, living creatures. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because... So, that's just like mm-hmm. yeah, I completely forgot about uh, magic with uh, uh, witch hat atelier, but yeah, because I think like what you mentioned is like because also because the it was the protagonist I've forgotten name uh, okay. sort of discovers mm-hmm. this sort of uh, sort of by accident but from a book from an old book she was given, 
But in doing that, because she had absolutely no idea what she did, what she was doing, like she did something very, uh, to be blunt, like very bad. Hmm. And it's sort of like, it's what propels um, the story forward is her sort of learning so she can undo what she did. Hmm. Sounds, a bit, sounds a bit of like Former Alchemist. Yeah, I would, I, I would recommend it. It's like, it's a nice. Like anyone who's listening to this and wondering uh, uh, what it is, it's a uh, manga. It's a manga, uh, and it's what I would recommend. Like it's like it's very it's cute art style and sort of very and sort of very sort of chill. But as I said, as we were meant, as we were me and uh, Echoes were talking about, as like Echoes was saying, it's a very good um, example of like a magic system with rules and then building upon that. Mm-hmm. I got an idea. I got a question for y'all real quick, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. I, sure. Since I was thinking, like, we can all point to examples of magic systems and stuff like that that we like, but, like, I'm curious, like, for each of you, how how do you approach, like, coming up with the magic system? Like, what's your method uh, and process? Ah, uh, that's a I, fun one. Interesting uh, one. Like, yeah, for I me, get, oh. I guess, uh, I don't know, because I've been doing, my magic system has been, I've been kind of working it from a long time, and I think a few core inspirations was funny enough pokemon build naruto and uh hunter hunter at the beginning and uh so i don't know i try to find that ways to have like checks and balances for each thing like a kind of like i guess like a big rock paper scissors thing was into a certain degree um though in the story itself environment and what people know and their knowledge and knowing their weaknesses come in come into play as well so um i try i don't know i just i I take mm. hold of a bunch of a few things I found really interesting and was inspirational, and I just kind of I've kind of blended them together, um, and yeah, just kind of come up with the system I have. So I have like a like it's like a bit of an elemental system, but mm. it kind of has you know like the you know like Nen when they put the they can shard it over themselves, like um, I thought it's called, but you know when they put they use a Nen they can protect themselves. So yeah, can, the aura. Yeah, yeah, the aura around them. So that they, they can do that, but with like with elements and. They usually need to have like a weapon of some sort of um outside trinket to help channel that because it comes from the planet but mixed with their own energy. Um, I try I try to keep it kind of close to some stuff like yeah like I guess a bit of avatar inspiration there but like I try to keep it like close to some sort of like martial arts related stuff as well because I I do like martial arts myself and uh mm. yeah it's just it's just kind of a little hot podge of a few ideas i liked here and there and i have to kind of like put it together and make my own thing yeah yeah i think i'm definitely i'm definitely of that mindset probably going a bit more into the extreme um basically it's whatever like because i said because i think I'm gonna stick with like specifically the my main story and it, it the most of the combat uh at least when i conceived it was whatever the heck i found was cool at the time uh and through sort of like trial and error sort of realizing what works what doesn't work and trimming out what doesn't work uh i've sort of at least like established like a sort of soft system like involving stuff like um sort of enhancing your body my my principles basically just in uh ca- characters who use like um say like mana can enhance their body uh just like to do like either like more strength or um faster reflexes and then mm-hmm. they can all, and then you have like people who can like channel into like objects to create like phenomenon and wizard wizards being one of those examples and then i've got like characters that fall outside of that category where it's sort of from like bio uh sort of like special r- rule sets that break from the norm uh if that makes sense that kind of and special, then, special category sort of. Yeah, and then also because like one thing I wanted to do was make sure that this system like isn't like the be all end all. I make sure like there are people who can't like in my main party that can't use magic at all, but can still like p- uh put pull their own in a uh, fight. And that character in specific is like one I have a lot of fun writing, mostly because it's like, as I said, it's a samurai. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know you know that. Yeah. So, um, 
Okay, so I guess it's I guess it's my turn now. Um, so. wind and all of that it also includes the concepts of light and shadow so what ends up happening is that the phonists draw the phonons into themselves and that's how they are able to cast spells and magic this is basically what i have within my world there is also a storm surrounding the planet in the ser in the series of specific rings and within those rings is the knowledge required to channel its power this is similar to how Final Fantasy VII handles the Materia system, in which it, the ability to use magic is sealed within Materia, the knowledge to actually wield the planet's energy. So within my work, it's the, ver it's the idea of working in harmony with the planet around you, the ability to tap into its wisdom, whether to harm or whether to assist other people. So it can be used both as a power source for devices, giant robots, machines, but it can also be channeled into specific things called catalysts. And the, the spread of catalysts are pretty far. So we can have things like, I don't know, we can have swords, we can have cannons, guns. And as of very recently, while I've been writing this, words. So like it's kind of like in Witch Hat Atelier where your magic is inscribed within glyphs. From my end, it's specific words, constellations, among other things. If you write a specific glyph that has a very specific meaning, depending on how it's written and depending on, the, on how the person is interpreting it, this will also determine what ability you will end up getting. So it kind of gives me a lot of freedom to play around with. Because at the end of the day, there's many different schools of thought for how this power works within my world. So depending on where you are, you can get someone who uses it more for defensive purposes, you can get someone who uses it for more offensive purposes, or you can get others who use it for every day, for every day, so they can actually get by and survive. So it's a basic situation of it's defined by culture, it's defined by location, but it's also defined by intent. And thanks to that, I'm actually able to have as much freedom with it as possible, but I still have some very defined rules on what it can or cannot do. Because in spite of what I just said, I've already made it clear that it can't do things like heal. It can probably do things like dull pain, but you cannot heal someone's wounds with it. You you would be better off you'd be better off trying to sell snake oil to someone at that point. But basically a lot of it is just um based on the environment and just the idea of taking from the world's bounties when it gives it to you, basically. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I guess did every uh did anyone else want to speak about magic system? Because I'm a, I don't have one, but I just want to just mention something that's adjacent. So, well, I have something I can add, but it can wait. Like I, mm -hmm. I dabble in magic systems for the fun of it, and I might be working on a little something on the side. But like the main reason I asked because I was thinking about it. Like with me, you all know how I am. I'm always about the how and trying to figure out the like core process and stuff like that and figuring out from other domains to bring to whatever to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And so with this, like even what you were, you all mentioned for how you did it, it actually reminded me of something that I actually um, came with today. So this mm -hmm. time around, I'm going to introduce you all to the five faces of genius. Hey, uh, oh. <laughs> that's a, that's a hell of a transition, man. Mm. <laughs> yes. Oh, five faces of genius. Like, have I mentioned this at all before? I can't remember. Not recording. Um, not in this call. I don't know if you remember I mentioned yeah. it earlier. Yeah, uh, I know not in this call. I talk about stuff all over the place, so I kind of lose track of what I'm talking about half the time or who I talked with. Yeah, uh, you and me both. <laughs> so, The Five Faces of Genius. This is a book I read a long, long time ago. It's um, about creative thinking and styles to succeed at stuff, and it breaks down stuff into different so five ways, and like, I've been experimenting with this with magic systems and, like, noticing how it helps, like, think in these ways, which, okay, let me pull this up. The actual five pieces actually are. One of them you all mentioned that I noticed, and it's the one I default to most. It's um, known as the alchemist. 
It's where you take elements from various things. You like mix them together and try and see what you can make out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which yeah, let's see. Here we go. You are the mal- alchemist. If you have the power to connect domains, different ideas, disciplines, systems of thoughts, put them together in a unique way to arrive at cutting edge projects. Which, like, really, this goes back to even what I talked about in my one episode on connectivity and like how that's how I figure out a bunch of stuff and so on. The other ones are um, there's the observer where you notice details uh, and you like figure out um, you put them together to build new combinations of ideas. Like you really center in on details and stuff like that. Mm. Which let's see one way, an example I can use actually Jujutsu Kaisen, right? Real quick for their system. Ah, let's, uh. let's even focus it on their system. I, I find more fascinating is the creative process that led to the system mm. and everything like that. And so, yeah, the creator stole from Ju- from Hunter Hunter. He, he like he's outright admitted it. He copied stuff with Nin, particularly that um. Remember, uh, if you've seen the arc where what was it, the Chimera Ants, with yeah. the one guy who had the the technique that could absolutely hit and everything like that. Mm. Yeah, that's what yeah, that's what all the do- that's what all the domains are based on. It's just taking that one idea and everything, focusing in on that and expanding it. And also, it's a combination of stuff from you. Even then, Yu Yu Hakusho, show, which that was based on with um, ah uh, yes, Esper, the, the, the domain systems like for the psychics, correct? Mm. Yep. Yeah, it's combining those two ideas together and pretty much is building this whole new technique out of it and observing stuff. There's the seer, which is um, your key is visualization and stuff like that, which I'm not exactly sure how I would put that to you using magic systems yet, but I can figure it out later on. Then the ones that interest me most are wonderful, which is where you celebrate weakness and you focus on like. Figuring out, figuring out ways to do stuff in inversion and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Finding absurd stuff and like, well, just being perseverant. The inversion part is what interests me because I'm like, what if you like take a system and everything, you work with idea and you come up with ways you can like do something in reverse. Like, let's say we're working with um the hunter, like that whole domain thing real quick. Mm-hmm. Like, what could we come up with if we like tried to reverse the ideas of domains instead of like, and so everybody inside this thing is affected by it. What if, like, everybody inside this is unaffected and everybody outside is affected by something or whatever? Mm, like, there's ways you could play with that and, like, try and explore ideas. Mm. And then there's also um, the Sage, which is also where I lean to a lot, where it's some um, simplification, where you try and strip away as much as you can that doesn't need to be there or superfluous and see what exists as you take stuff away and so on. Oh, yeah, this actually connects to... Whatever, I thought about something else. I'll come back to that later. <laughs> but, like, um, pretty much you strip away, you try and simplify, you use as little as possible to see as you can. So, like, for instance, I was messing around with... Um, like, take Dragon Ball. I was messing around, like... One of the things I actually like about Dragon Ball before Dragon Ball Z is just how more simplified everything was and how grounded it was. Mm-hmm. And I liked, like, some of the stuff, and I was thinking with messages, I was like... Yeah, what if, like, you couldn't shoot beings, but you had certain powers and everything like that on this level? I was thinking, it was like, okay, what if I had to work with just, just pure power? How could I do ranged attacks and so on? And so you end up looking for ways like that. Like, there's the um, Air um, air Force stuff, like you can see in My Hero Academia or various other things. Like, mm-hmm. people who do the flick and knock people back with Air Force. Um, There's picking up rocks and using them as bullets and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, There's... Actually, example I really like Yu Yu Hakusho from when they were fighting Toguru and when he was doing the um thing with the thumb when he was like using that to create Air Force for strikes and so on like that and like chipping off pieces of his body. I think he was. I can't remember. Mm. But yeah, like finding ways to simplify it and like reducing the amount of details and focusing in on stuff is another thing I just really like to do with that. Mm. And I did remember another book, but I'm not going to go into that this time. But since it's something I'm working on still, and I'm not exactly ready for all the details there yet. Um, no worries. Yeah, but I think I was gonna say this earlier. I think one really interesting is we kind of touched upon it already, but I had really interesting knowledge about it. It's like the interesting thing about power systems in general, especially when you do them like um, you put like a lot of work into it, is it becomes like it becomes a toolbox with you have your tools, and if you like you can do one way, which I won't recommend doing. Having every tool you can think of, which is kind of a um AKA just having everything, and trying to you know run around trying to deal with every situation with the perfect tool. Or you can have a very limited toolbox, but the but you get creative with what you how you use that tool to deal with a situation, and it just it helps it helps you to be more creative of how you deal of any problem. So any issue that comes up, it becomes more of a puzzle. It's like okay. I have this. I have this situation in front of me. 
and I only have this this these tools. What can I do with these that um to help alleviate the situation? And I think it just gets like when you when you find that balance between like having the right amount of tools in your toolbox and the situations you're gonna put your characters in, it's where you get the most fun out of the out of the out of the system. But yeah. Yeah, it's the law of simplicity. Like to quote this, um basically as counterintuitive as it seems, the more options you have, the less likely you are to make progress. Mm-hmm. The more like you No, keep, that is very true. Yeah, the more like you focus and like narrow in on something, the more likely you're to think to think innovative and like figure out mm-hmm. ways to make whatever work and so on like that. And yeah. that's the top reason why I'm always against like people trying to get too many options or even when it comes to my whole thing as like I focus on craft and stuff like that. I'm intentionally limiting myself so I can focus in on something mm. and then execute that as best I can. And it turns out really, really great writing and stuff like that. Yeah, because at, yeah. Cause at the end of the day, like even in spite of the amount of options and scale I have, I intentionally try to keep it within a foreseeable limit because mm. really I'm still telling a, a story that is more character oriented and it just so happens to have these fantastical elements behind the scenes. But at the end, uh, but still, I it's better for you not to not to spread your tentacles out too wide if you if you know what i mean you don't have to go too wide i mean thankfully if you have a system that can allow you to kind of have like this big sandbox it's it's great perfect even i'd argue but sometimes um and i'm kind of realizing this more as i do short stories within short stories i'm freer to actually explore the other aspects of my system that i can't explore in my main story mm-hmm. so in a sense, you get more freedom within your short stories sometimes than you do with your major projects. Or, in some cases, let's say, for example, I'm going to bring up another another universe, and I'm surprised that we haven't brought it up yet since we started this conversation about magic systems. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to bring up the Nasuverse. Though, you know, Fate, Tsukihime, <laughs> oh, I'm holding back intentionally from bringing it up for a reason. <laughs> yeah, like... like you see, the thing about the Nasuverse is just how fundamentally vast it is. Not just with characters, but just how utterly insane the different aspects of its magic and capabilities spread. It's like, you have a different system for like the Holy Grail War, how the servants work. Then there's the Mystic Eyes of Death Perception on a small, on a small scale, small town level. It's like, the Nasuverse, if you ask me fully encompasses this idea of you have a wide expanse of magic you have a wide system but it's but it is impossible for your one story to fully capture the scale of your imagination Mm. this is where working on multiple projects within the same universe comes in Mm. of course this isn't this isn't to downplay the idea of uh, of simplifying your systems because Mm. believe me despite how you know unwieldy the Nasuverse may be to some people, I think it is a perfect example of what you've described here. It's like, the systems within the Nasuverse are vast and complex, yes, but when you are, re- when you're watching Fate Stay Night, or you're checking out Karen no Kyokai, you are seeing you're seeing at least two different versions of a different story, but the same rules still kind of apply. You're just not seeing the full picture, which is mm. perfectly fine for what you're, for what you're seeing. Yeah. Basically, what you have is, is a situation of the Nasuverse is very dense with its ideas and concepts, but it does not front load all of them to you at once. It never comes close to that. I mean, if you read the visual novels, yes, they may front load you with a lot of stuff, but what you get within Fate Stay Night and Tsukihime fundamentally are two different things. And if you want me to take this even further, there's also Witch on the Holy Night, which is very much based on the societal aspect of how the system works. Rather than just on the battle aspect, this one is more concerned about how the societal aspect works. And it's fundamentally different from the other two stories that I mentioned. So the my point at the my point here is if you have a if if you notice that you haven't used everything your magic system has to offer, that is not a failing of your story. Mm. It just means that your focus was elsewhere. Mm. Not a bad thing. Mm. Yeah, but in fact, it would be a good thing because it means you actually you did you had the restraint to actually know mm-hmm. to use what you needed to use and not just throw everything in there but just because you have it. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Plus, also with not too verse, I'll throw this off. It also is a good example of how things can get messy if you haven't too much because, mm-hmm. like, even just taking to fate alone. Let's see. We have the some. We have the servants and all the stuff they're doing, and then we have all their techniques and stuff that are supposed to do these various things that 
don't happen most of the time because something else happens and so on and just gets mm-hmm. such a mess and complicated and mm-hmm. uh, leads. And then there's the moon, but we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, ooh. Oh, I, 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 guys, have you ever felt your blood pressure rise in real time before? Because <laughs> that's what just happened to me. <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm like, you can get super messy. It's like, should I just take the moon and that's it? Like, no. Oh, my yeah. God. I, 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 the, the funny thing is, I don't know much about the fate universe over in the grand scheme of things. I think I watched a video, too, about it because I, I like, you know, big universes. I find it interesting. And I vaguely remember hearing talk about the moon. So just hearing that, just yeah. That's just Listen, like, yeah. There's, there's a lot to the moon. I'm the not, the moon is a vampire. I'm gonna say, oh, scared oh, to I'm ask. A, I'm gonna say one more thing. I'm about, I'm, I'm, I'm about, I'm about to make Mark's blood pressure, uh, blood pressure go up. <laughs> the moon. How about the moon cell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't know. We do not talk about fate extra. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, Listen, oh, if you think regular fate yeah. is weird. If you yeah, think the regular fate is yeah, weird, that's, I've just seen the I mean images of um, <laughs> uh, Fate Extra. I have no idea what the heck this is supposed to be. Listen. And, and, and you're not messing with Fate Grand Order. That's where it gets even more psycho. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think what Actually, lost yeah. me... Nice yeah, to go, to go on Fate, what lost me was Fate Apocalypta, which is yeah. what, yeah. Has yeah. one of the most yeah. convoluted yeah. stories I've ever seen in an anime and i have seen plenty of convoluted stuff and stuff i would argue is even worse Mm, (laughs) like apocrypha is like like um listen despite the fact that i give the the nasu verse glowing praise yeah yeah like i give the nasu verse a glowing level of praise but Mm. i am not blind to its problems apocrypha is one of those issues and even within the stuff that i Mm. do like about the nasu verse you could argue that a lot mm. of its conceptual stuff does get a little bit too front loaded for its own good, even when it's executed well. And and I did mention this at one point, the whole thing of Shiro to being able to take out Gilgamesh, but I've also mentioned that I kind of like the the idea of it. But mm. what I'm really getting at with this point is this kind of stuff for for all the positives there are nothing is ever ironclad. Nothing is ever perfect. Mm. It's like, the Nasuverse is probably one of the best examples of what happens when you have a vast array of characters, systems, and other aspects just interacting with each other within a small-scale space or a grand-scale space. But Mm. it can be relatively overwhelming even into itself every now and again. Like Mm. One of the best examples I can point to to that is just Kara no Kyokai's fifth movie, Paradox Spiral. And let me just catch everyone up to speed. Paradox Spiral introduces a very weird idea of people's names, their origins. Like their names are very inherent to what their abilities are or what their concepts can um, can can execute. So on top of all the crazy stuff that's going on in Karano Kyokai, we now need to contend with the fact that people's literal names play a role in what power and what destiny they have. So due to that, there is a lot of wiggle room. In the um for this system, and now because of that, I bet you're scratching your head. What exactly does that even mean? Well, here's the thing about that: the answer that you get in Kara no Kyokai, as clear as it is, depending on who and on who you ask, you're still going to be asking, okay, but what exactly does that mean? If this character's origin is to devour, how far can that go? How far does it go? Within the within the limitations of him either being a human or this divine entity, mm. like it's, it's, do you see what it's, it sounds like? The answer is yes. That's it. Yes, basically, yes, basically. Mm. But again, this is kind of what makes things. This is kind of what makes things a bit overwhelming, depending on who you ask. Again, like I said before, like. And if you want me to take it a step further, if you have the uh, if you have eyes that can literally kill someone with a point, like you touch, you know, like the mystic eyes of death reception basically allow you to kill a target just by touching them. But it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. It doesn't necessarily kill you; it just quote unquote ends your concept of existence. Mm-hmm. Again, do you see how this can get ridiculous? Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said before. I will praise the Nasuverse. I love it to, be, to pieces, but I can understand why all of this can be extremely stupid, depending on who you are. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. I think my like my sort of like 
I've, I've actually had, uh, like you talking about the Nazi verse, I actually I thought of like an example on my end, uh, which is like Final Fantasy 14, 14 and specifically 14. Because mm. uh, mm. actually, thinking, actually thinking about it, because like I do, I still play that game. I'm looking forward to Dawn Trail. Oh, sorry, one sec. Uh, and um, I th- I've, I do think, like, I find, like, its magic systems actually a lot more, like, complex and in-depth uh, than people would, like, generally uh, think about it. Especially because, like, for one, it's an MMO. But essentially, uh, but there's one, like, uh, so one, like, uh, one of the main antagonists of, like, for most of the series is the uh, Garlean Empire. Uh, and what you learn, like, as you go through the story is that uh, what the the biggest weakness the Garleans have is that they actually cannot use magic or like um or specifically they cannot channel ether whereas like um you sort of in your uh in like um say eorzea like everyone can use some sort of magic everyone can like um attune to the uh, etherite crystals and literally teleport uh across like the city city states the Garleans simply cannot do that because they don't have any magic. So they had to develop uh, science and technology and their magitech in order to um, counter that. And this ended up being stronger than anyone that can use magic, where they would end up conquering most of the main continent uh, by the time uh, of the... But I'm going to say by the time of the first... Final Fantasy XIV, that was uh, so bad it was um, literally destroyed. Uh, but I think, like, that's a, like, and it's still, like, uh, and I think, like, that's a good example of, like, a uh, sort of a system that was made to sort of be, like, a sandbox where, like, there's, like, specific rules in place, but it's enough to sort of, like, just throw in um, sort of, like, weird and cool shit, and also, like, playing on um also like the final fantasy's history so i think one one example i'd like to bring up is the omega raids in um which is at the end of uh stormblood and this is where like the, you literally end up fighting against um enemies from final fantasy 5 going up to x death final fantasy 6 going up to kefka and then uh the final one being like Final Fantasy, first starting with Chaos from the original Final Fantasy, before you then go to fight um, Omega, which is but in the series he's always been this sort of strange machine where he's a machine that exists outside the rules, the established rules, mm-hmm. and is just uh, first introduced in the very first game as a super boss that you can randomly encounter, but since sort of become this sort of omnipotent um, machine that's terrifying to face. Uh, and his final form is like him literally transcending space and time. Uh, so as I said, like, uh, there is a, like, a, uh, even like, no matter how, uh, my general point is like, with 14, like, no matter how insane some of the things end up being, it still like, ends up making sense because it explains like, the rules it's play playing on so it's as i said like uh as uh i think mark mentioned um oh. it's not about sort of uh restrictions you put on like magic systems or, like the rules you can put uh doesn't like hold anything back if anything yeah. it just is, gives is it you lens a is playbook it, yeah is it like is it, is it complex and then like with the case of like with the case of omega you can then put something in that completely transcends those rules. Mm, yeah. No. Oh. Since we're speaking about rules, there's something I oh. wanted to there's something I wanted to throw out here. It, mm-hmm. it just kind of came to mind while we were talking about all this. So so far we've been talking about rules within the confines of stories. But I thought about something else, and this is something that I tend to see within a specific franchise that I may or may not be obsessed with. Um so Let's talk about Gundam for a second, all right? <laughs> just for a second, all right? It, <laughs> just it, it, just it, a little it, Gundam. It, just, yeah, 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 yeah. Just a we little. Do, 
we do a little Gundam around here. I hope you understand. <laughs> please, please, for, please forgive me. So let me let, um, let me just jump right to it. So I've noticed that Gundam, preferably like Zeta, Double Zeta, even OG, and of course Unicorn, have a very oh, and Char's Counterattack in particular. I've noticed that these series have have a very unifying concept. And me bringing up Unicorn in this context may get some people upset, but. <laughs> Gundam is very thematically resonant with its rules. And what do I mean by this? You see, so far, when we talk about magic systems, like with what Mark has mentioned and what we've all talked about, we all talk about this idea of limitations and of you know specific things that prevent things from going completely off the rails. Gundam, on the other hand, does not care about this whatsoever, despite what some people may tell you. Gundam is, especially UC, it is more than willing to absolutely pull some of the most batshit crazy stuff all for the sake of getting to its theme or getting to its message. For example, we are introduced to the concept of new types, this ability to quote-unquote understand each other, to transcend the limits of fragile, simple human understanding. But... With this comes comes specific psychic phenomena that we witness throughout the franchise. Characters who who are not even directly in front of each other can speak to one another. They can hear what the other person is thinking. They can somewhat under they can somehow understand someone else's experience without even without having any concept of who the person they were before. They don't have any notion of how that works. In Shara's Counterattack, the will to actually fight, the will to actually fight back against corruption, or at least to prevent the Earth from being destroyed, is what prevents a freaking asteroid from falling on the face of it. This is all in service of this theme of understanding and coming to terms with the fact that we may be small, but if we somehow are able to put aside our differences, we can at least come to a better conclusion. Even if, it, even, if it's, even if it's a cost, we can still get there in some light. And that's mainly due to, quote-unquote, the light of the human heart. Gundam, again, depending on where you are as a writer, as a person, this may come across as absolutely ridiculous. Pants even. It even kind of flies in the face of everything that we've been talking about at this point. But... I kind of like the fact that we have something that is so concerned with its themes that it's more than willing to pull this silly stuff here and there. Now, granted, I don't know if I myself could do it, but and it's probably not the first thing you think about with a magic system, but I kind of think that this kind of belongs in its own class if it doesn't already have one. I don't know. I disagree. Like, I disagree in the terms of I believe it does fit in terms of magic system simply because um, mm -hmm. I think the main rule, the main things about magic system is, at the end of the day, it's if you want it to be more than just a flashy fireball goes here and that stuff, it actually right. does have a, a, a theme or meaning behind it. it could, sometimes it could just be not, you know, a small thing. Like I guess in um, I'll say small thing, but like mm -hmm. in in I think the Stormlight Archives, where I think people with the power have light eyes, and the people with dark with don't have the power have dark eyes. If I remember correctly, and mm -hmm. that is. Is his kind of way of showing different races and like his uh, different classes, um, in a story about using skin color, for example, um, and that's that is uh, it's it's part of the power system, but it's also bringing up a theme. Um, this is just it's taking that to the extreme where it's just they've just like these things is all is always a spectrum. It's not like a fixed thing. So in this regard, it sounds like they've taken that. Oh, we're gonna use this power. This talk use this power to the extreme for the mm -hmm. point of the story so if anything it's almost put in the magic front and center if you want to call it magic mm -hmm. in that regard so i would say i would say it definitely fits in, in there yeah 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 mm -hmm. i i genuinely feel this um this way about it it's one of the reasons why i've always found uc gundam to be a very fascinating idea of a very literal understanding or at least a very literal handling of its ideas and concepts mm -hmm. it might fly in the face of what you might want from a quote-unquote grounded war story but I think this thematic resonance and um, this very poetic way of handling it is really what draws a lot of people to Gundam. And I feel like it's been inherent to it from the beginning. Now, granted, of course, I get it. Um, the ability to literally turn back time on a specific machine to prevent it from being 
you know, like to kind of stop it from fighting and all that. That might be a little, a little heavy handed, a little ham fisted mm. even. But mm. the fact that this has kind of been the end game of put down your weapons, let's not fight anymore, and it takes something like that to bring it front and center. I mean, I probably wouldn't do it myself, but the fact that they actually did and it actually makes sense and it's coherence really, really sells it for me. Mm. Really sells it for me in that regard. Mm. So, if I could, I mean, if I, if I could create a class, if I could create a class for it, if it doesn't already exist, I would just call it literal thematic resonance at that point. I, that's mm. what I'd call it. I, like I said, I personally myself would probably not write like that. I mm. do not know if I have that level of faith in what I would do, but I tend to appreciate those who can pull something like that off without making me go entirely. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not feel. I'm not sure about this one, Chief. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. We're definitely one of them. It sounds like you love it or hate it, sort of thing, because you're really just basically it's it just really in your face. So yeah, it's really people who like it or like it. People who don't they're just yeah, they don't, they don't. Um, I did have a, a question. It's kind of related to when you're talking about uh the whole fates verse story. We're not going necessarily into fate, but it's got me thinking because I'm not sure I've heard seen much stuff about this and see about this. But um, like, what would you say is the, like good advice if you're making a a universe that is, you know, in terms of magic, more focused on the magic side of things. Like, oh, like, Ooh. so you can have that freedom to have different worlds and stuff where you can mess with, like, different ideas of the power. Like, what would you say, going, just going off, like, you talk about fate and you're saying there's things you like about it and things you don't like about it. What would you kind of think you, you'd do? I have, I like, I have my own ideas because I've kind of, I touch um, upon this a bit myself in story. I think, I think I want to, I want to go last for this one since I, since I had that tangent about Gundam and everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but what, sorry, what was the question again? Sorry. Um, so what, like, what would you do? Like, what would you say is good advice to, if you're building a universe centered on like the magic system? So that way you could have, you can like say, like for you, like a shonen, like a shonen Lester verse, for example. Like, <laughs> so, like, what would you do um, to make it work for you? Or what you say okay, I'm gonna say it's actually very scary that you mentioned that specific <laughs> uh, question. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, so um, to sort of answer in a way that uh, doesn't imply that I am actually trying to do that. Um, <laughs> I'd say try, I think ultimately try to come up with like a over, overarching core of like what your sort of system can or can't do. So for me, for example, I've, as I've mentioned, I've sort of gone for like mana, be, like power being used to enhance or the body or like being channeled into things that can basically, uh, pull, pull off like, uh, 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 phenomenon so, like magic, mm. uh, and then I've sort of I bet what I bet my process essentially is taking that. Uh, to say if I I were to do that, mm. I would take that concept and s apply it into say and the other like multiverse, but tune it and tune it so it's specific to that one. But um, sort of have like different like alterations to sort of make it unique to say said world. So, for example, if they're uh, in like a sort of hollowed out um, sphere where the power, where a lot of power actually comes from that sphere itself, uh, mm. some of that magic will then actually be actually uh, be focused on like the thematics of that world if that makes sense no. and then obviously like they'll, you'll have um probably uh different like technologies of different sort of worlds and you might have like cases where say like magic actually ends up corrupting to the point where they have to... so similar to like the galleons they have to think of a way to count where they can't use where say like they can't use magic so they have to do something else. So I'd say just have like, because um, I think like one thing you have to avoid is to say what like Mark said is 
throw everything you think is cool into it. Mm. Say like, uh, oh, I, I watched Naruto. I like that. I'm going to put that in. Oh, I like, oh, Bleach is cool. I'm putting that in. Uh, uh, Fairy Tale. I'm putting that in. Alchemy from Full Metal. I'm putting that in. Uh, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. You're just going to have a complete mess. You're just going to end up with a complete mess. So mm. my real advice is just sort of find a core and then focus focus on that core and then build it out mm. yeah. to sort of mm. make sense to say if you're doing like another world mm. nah, yeah. uh, oh, do you go? oh i was gonna say my way of doing it real quick since yeah, I've, kind of, I've kind of already given this to people like first i figure out what the concept of the magic is is it a cookbook engineering art negotiation divine favor reality shaping like, I usually will pick from one of those six. You can mix in elements and stuff from other ones. I Like, pretty much these are those are all categories to structure the magic and stuff like that. And then once I just have that structure, I build within that, figure out... Um, and with that in mind, that's why I also split up sources of magic and who the magic choosers are, so I can keep track of stuff that way. And pretty much once I have really answered those three questions, I feel simplifies everything, because from there, it's just a case of, what do I want to do? I take that like a certain effect. Like um, yesterday, I was messing around with just for this in advance. I was just seeing what can I do to like make a bunch of stuff up just to see. And I noticed I would like take a basic concept, and then I would pretty much be like, all right, I want to do this. Like I want to do something healing related, and then I'd pretty much just try and figure out a way to work something in between. Like I got this, I have this result. How can I have this lead to this? And pretty much then I just focus on whatever like type of system I'm working with. Like is it um is it negotiation? Then I'll figure out something negotiation based and stuff like that. Is it art? Then I'll focus on stuff that's like it's unique to this person alone. Is it a cookbook? Then I'll have figure out what the recipe is and something like that. Mm-hmm. Engineering, then well, you get the idea pretty much. Like that's how I put in the focus it. I, how I would tend to approach it and like make stuff really focused and everything so it stays consistent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so. Um, I was going to say just one thing that you said, which I totally agree with, like, don't just throw everything in. But I've also that as well. If you're going to throw stuff in, we kind of touched upon this already. If you're going to throw stuff in, I think, ask yourself why and try it again, try to make the ma- the magic deep than just trying to throw everything in. So at least when you do to pick up something, you ask yourself, okay, this is cool, but why is it cool? And in fact, I think maybe go one further. Why is it cool? What do I like about this thing I, I'm about to pick? What don't I like about the thing? And how would I do it differently? Then, mm. so that at least that way it goes through a few layers of, you know, scrutiny before you actually put it in, and then, yeah, hopefully that will alleviate you from, you know, having toolbox of billion stuff you don't really not really use, and it makes your magic less deep. Mm. Um, I guess my analogy is not too different from not too dissimilar from yours under like grand scheme of things, because I do believe that you did you should have like a core sort of system that is kind of will be related to all of them. So I kind of imagine it like, um, I don't know, I, think, I was thinking of an analogy. I guess maybe the best analogy I can think about is like, we believe that the earth is a product of the sun. So the elements of the sun made the earth. And then we ourselves are made from the earth. So the magic system, that core magic system of the universe that's going to connect all the universes is the sun. And then the earth is probably one world from that, um, from that sun. And then the the, the person who's made of the elements of the earth is the person who can use the magic. Um, so in that way, you can have different worlds, but there is this, there is this underlying, there is this underlying rules that kind of are related to all of them. And then there's this way where there's this route to a pure, the pure magic, the, or that the, the core magic that, that the, what the universe governs on is the same. So there's this like, there's this lineage to all the universes in terms of where they get their powers from, although the elements may be different, or although they looked at it different and use it differently, uh, or whatnot, there is this core like system that kind of binds them all together. That's kind of that's like at least my thoughts on how I do it. But yeah, I just thought it was an interesting question because I don't I don't think I see much things about like doing universes because I just imagine it's just kind of like layering powers on top of it. Like it's kind of layering. There's a core mm. power. Then it's kind of having a system that uses that channels that power it in a, a certain in a elements different of that way. power. Yeah, it, yeah, Ch- channels certain elements of that power. Maybe not everything, for not everything. And then there, from there, there's another system that probably uses like one or two elements from from that. So there's a few layers in 
and then mm. die from cabinet cuts. So that's yeah, that's how kind of how I see it. But yeah, mm. cool. Um, I think that's most part of the magic system covered. Is there any any closing statements? Um, oh, um, I, I, I wanted to go, but does, oh, does, sorry, um, oh, sorry, yeah, 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 no, you're good, you're good. But I was wondering, um, does, <laughs> does, does Echoes have an opinion on this one too? On what was the question again? <laughs> oh, so if you were to make, I guess, a magic universe, like, if, sorry, if you were to make uh, a universe, I guess, like, um, yeah, for example, like Fates, because of Fate, Fate, um, Fate Day Night, so a universe like that, so where there's all these different worlds and they use powers in different ways, but it's all kind of linked to a core power, I believe. Is it the same with fate? I believe it's the same Yeah. Yeah. That's... Like, yeah. How would you, how would you go, how would you go about it? What would you like do maybe the same as that or differently? Or just how would you do it yourself? How would you see? Mm, sadly, I haven't really thought about it, mm. but I do think at the very least, like fate's an interesting example, be just because mm. it's kind of very loose where, um, like, the whole thing with mages and the reliance on magic, blah, blah, blah. It's, like, essentially, um, what do you call it? It's the idea that magic should be mystical and, um, and in a way should be hidden from most people, I think. Mm. I don't know. It's, mm. It has, the rules it has are kind of strange. I think um, how it works is essentially, like, um, I mean, I haven't really thought about it for myself personally, but there definitely has to be some sort of overarching sort of logic in some way without it being just too much bs because fate sort of treads a weird line where some of it kind of makes sense and some of it's just bs so it's that's sort of kind like of the point with <laughs> like the, actually that's the difference between true magic and magecraft true magic is bull bullshit that nobody understands and like yes. the fact that nobody <laughs> and the fact that nobody understands it is what makes it so powerful exactly <laughs> again yeah. it's like i said like if you want the best if you want the story to tell you what that stuff actually is which on the holy night will actually tell you that that's literally what it is that is the literal difference like what you're saying is not hyperbole it's just true no nah, yeah that's true mm-hmm. yeah but as long as that the logic is there then i think it'll work um as long as you stay consistent, mm. um, I I just I think the only issue with fate is that it tends to break its own rules like all the time, to a point that if you can't take it seriously <laughs> that much because um I actually p- play fake grand order for example, and it doesn't really break rules per se, but sometimes it talks about like all these concepts and I'm like, what the hell? But like you just roll with it anyway because that's just mm. how the story works. Mm. So sometimes like sometimes like if. Like, like I appreciate when certain concepts or certain worlds have the confidence to kind of go through their BS. Mm. But um regardless, um having some sort of logic system to make things coherent also helps too. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so um Okay. So I have a this is something I have been dabbling with since I started the short stories, and it's probably gonna echo a lot of what's already been said, but the way how I do it is I try to consider, since this is a story that takes place on a planet, you know, with humanity moving there, I figured I'd try to take a look at, like, the different eras of people adapting to the world and how much they know about how their, how the systems work and, you know, their knowledge of the magic that comes with it. So I will typically... I will typically um, write a short story within the world based on the time period, as well as what I just mentioned. So what comes along with it is basically, I will think of a scenario with a group of characters, and then once I think of that scenario, once I put the idea of it in mind, then I think about, okay, so how will the magic for this planet be used in this particular arc, and how important is it? Is it important for the character and their growth, or is it simply a means to an end to get to the conclusion? Once I determine, once I determine things based on that simple binary, I then kind of try to open up the spectrum as far as what I'm discussing or what my themes are for that particular episode. In that sense, it can sometimes be a means to an end, or sometimes it can also be used to tell a grander story based on that one particular uh, that one particular theme and concept I have. So whether it is a, a one-off story or maybe like a long-term, if it's something that I am not able to cover within my major projects, if it's something that I can dabble with within something else, 
chances are I am going to find the ability to do so within another story or if in another concept that I want to explore. So yeah, and without without really echoing what everyone else has already said, I basically feel as though if it's something that you feel is cool or something that you want to explore more on an, on a, on another basis, that's when that's when I'll typically do it. And thankfully, the setting that I have allows for this. If your setting can allow for this kind of thing, it doesn't have to be limited to just one place or one location. Then, in my opinion, I feel like you, you can just go nuts at that point, as you should. You're the writer. You're supposed yeah. to be having fun with your stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um. Okay, I think that's it for Magic Systems. Um, unless you, you got any closing statements? I have one. Mm. Mm. With regards to junk Gundam, <laughs> G Gundam is the only good Gundam. That's why it's called Good Gundam. That's it. Base. I'm done. Base? Oh, I, no, hold up. Hold up. No. Bye. Mark, 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 my man, you can't just drop that bomb and not give us a speech. Come on now. Wait, Come which on. Gundam? Sorry, which G- Gundam? G Gundam. G Gundam. G Gundam is the only good Gundam. That's why it's oh. called G Gundam. Nah, nah, he's, he's got a point. It ain't the only he's, he's good cooking Gundam. a point. I'll be honest. Nah, nah. I mean, it ain't the only good Gundam, but to be fair, G Gundam <laughs> is pretty good, though. <laughs> okay, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> I'm going to prove that G Gundam is the greatest Gundam with the help of KOG! <laughs> I'm just saying, Kangaroo Gundam is the greatest Gundam. The Jump Gundam. <laughs> It's a it's a kangaroo it's it's a kangaroo piloting a mecha kangaroo. And, that, oh, okay. That, that's, that's the instant argument. That's what that's all I need to hear. Like th- that's it. Like yeah. Barbata, <laughs> it's still listen. the Barbatos for me. It's listen, so aggressive. Listen. But 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 James, have you considered Tequila Gundam? Have you considered Mermaid Gundam? <laughs> listen, listen, guys. I mean, I mean, I've seen Aerial Gundam. I have a model of of it uh, with me. <laughs> No, no, no. Let's no, make Jump no. Gundam even better. Jump Gundam is a king. To make it even better, aside from the fact that it has boxing gloves and stuff like that, mm. it has a little baby Gundam kangaroo oh, for the God. baby Gundam thing. Oh, for the kangaroo God. inside it to also have a Gundam. Oh, so God. it's instantly it's a, the best Gundam ever. It's a Gundam that's within a, a Gundam. That's it, bro. That, exactly. Yeah, that's that's piloted mean, by a, a baby kangaroo. Oh, God. And it did. And they did that Gundam within a Gundam thing before Double O did. Let that sink in, people. G oh, Gundam wow. truly is the best Gundam. Forget your Gundam UCs. Forget your Shars counterattacks. Forget your your Witch from Mercury's. Forget about all of that. G Gundam is best Gundam. That's the facts. <laughs> oh, you, you heard it Disc- here first. Dis- discla- <laughs> discla- disclaimer, turn A is still better. <laughs> turn A has the machine with the mustache. Yes, Turn A is still the best Gundam and the best Gundam series. I will hear no other opinion. But G Gundam is a pretty close second, though. I will admit that much. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just going to put this picture in the chat. That's all I got to put. I think that, that picture wins every day. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's in chat. Oh, my God. Let me go to chat for guys because I'm going to looks... have it on a thing. One sec. One sec. It, looks like, it looks like something from Mega Man. <laughs> I know, oh, that's gosh. why it's awesome. <laughs> it doesn't look like a Megamind, oh my gosh. Listen, listen, guys, I'm just saying, he who spreads the gospel of G Gundam is forever based. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, anything, well, anything that's, uh, anything's better than Zero Zero, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even gonna, <laughs> no. I'm not even gonna try to top this with an outro. Um... Yeah, oh, that is, inc- this is incredible. Yeah, yeah we, we peaked right here, guys. This is it. This, this is peak podcasting yeah. right now. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, guys. my yeah. God. Like, why? Uh, oh, oh, listen. Uh, okay, no. Pack it up. We're done. Yeah, yeah. I'm, no. I'm going yeah. yeah. to do, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a quick closing. I'm not even going to. Yeah, that's it. I'm, you're right. I'm going to do a no, quick closing. No, that right there. Listen. Yeah. If you ever want to end a conversation, the best way to end it it's the post the nether gundam all right listen <laughs> listen guys i just want y'all to know everyone here is forever blessed because you get to witness the beauty the beauty of the windmill listen guys <laughs> don't let anybody tell you that g gundam ain't a masterpiece cuz this racket lasts forever <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right, I'm changing the title of this 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 podcast when I put it on YouTube. It's about it's about the game. When no condom gives cancer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'll put it, I'll put it in brackets. I'll put it in brackets. Uh, right, guys. Yeah, this is uh, it's been a great podcast. Um, yeah, I'm not even gonna bother trying to uh, top the exit outro there. So I'm just gonna cut it right right here. So yeah, it's been yeah. been good seeing you guys. Uh, take care and see you next time. Take, see bye. ya. Bye. See you. Later.